Please open with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I want to share with you about a guy who was facing an insurmountable crisis. He was about to lose everything, not just his house or his position, his family, his friends, or his health, but his very life was in jeopardy. This person was King Jehoshaphat of Judah. He was in big trouble. And I'm sure that we can all relate to him in one way or another, as we have all had various trials. And if you haven't had any trials yet, just wait, and I'm sure that some will come your way. It's just a matter of time. So again, in Second Chronicles chapter 20, here we see it says, <clears throat> It happened after that that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea from Syria, and they are in Hazazon Tamar, which is in En Gedi. So the first thing that we have to do when we are faced with a crisis, which may seem obvious, but we have to recognize it. We have to recognize that we are in trouble. You know, sometimes it seems just a lot easier to kind of stick our heads in the proverbial sand and say, well, nothing is really happening out there. Everything's going to be okay and to not worry about it. But the first thing to do is say, wow, we are in trouble and we need to take action. And the next thing we have to do is what he does right here. It says in verse 3, And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. When we are faced with a crisis, the very first thing that we need to do is go immediately to prayer. To go immediately to prayer. That is going to change everything. Because you see, our strength is in the Lord, isn't it? That is where we find our hope. That is where we find that his mercy endures forever. And when it seems like the enemy is going to come up against us and destroy us, then we have to go and set our face to the Lord. And it says that Jehoshaphat feared. The word here may be not so much that he was simply afraid, which I'm sure he was, but that he was a God-fearer. He feared God, and so he did the right thing, which was by going to God. And then as they proclaimed a fast, they came and they were seeking God's help diligently. They were looking to him for those things to get him through these tough times. Now, we all go through trials. We all go through trials. It may be a relationship Maybe something to do with your finances. Maybe your mortgage is in trouble. You can't pay the rent. Maybe there's sickness in your family, and you just don't know what to do. Uh, it could also be the death of a family member, or maybe it's the loss of work, or whatever it is. But we all have, in our own ways, faced these different trials. And there's probably a lot of things I didn't even mention there. But you understand what a trial is. And again, this is where we come before the Lord and say, Lord, I need you because I know that you are going to do some amazing things. And, you know, we really shouldn't be surprised by these trials when we face them either. Uh, Jesus said, he said, in this world you will have tribulation, but take courage for I have overcome the world. So our Lord himself guaranteed that we are going to have trials. In the book of James, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Peter put it this way, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So again, he, he hears about this great army that's coming against him. We learn later in the chapter that they were coming to utterly destroy the people of Judah. And, you know, sometimes we find that the trial is of our own doing. Sometimes it's our fault. We kind of get ourselves into a bad spot. And I think this is one of Satan's favorites. When, he, when we find that, you know, we, so we've done something to really mess it up. 
Maybe we made a, a bad decision financially. Maybe we, uh, we married someone who was not a believer at the time, and now we're faced with some, some kind of tough challenges in life. Uh, whatever it may be, it's those times when Satan comes to us and he says, you know what, this is really your fault. And the Lord's not going to help you with this one because you got yourself in this mess. And that's when you start saying, yeah, yeah, you're right. I got myself in this mess. I kind of deserve this. You're right, the Lord's not going to help me because, I mean, if I had just listened to the Lord, this would not have happened. But then, you see, this happened to me, and then one day I, I really woke up and I said, well, hold on. You know, if you kind of think about it, if you think of all of human history, the whole thing is, the whole sin issue is really our doing because it was Adam and Eve that, that disobeyed God in the first place. And as a result of that, we have all these other trials. And so I thought, if the Lord was willing to go and to pay for my sin on the cross that had separated me from him, then how much more is he going to be willing to forgive me when I get myself in a trial? Now, you see, King Jehoshaphat, though he was a great king, if we you read the chapters before you, you'll find that King Jehoshaphat was one of the great kings of Judah. Now, you remember that early on, after Solomon, that the northern and southern kingdoms divided. And from there, you have uh, mostly bad kings in the north, and then you have some, you know, quite a few good kings in the south, but you had quite a few bad ones as well. And then ultimately, the kingdom fell in 586, the southern, southern kingdom. But you had three great reformers in the southern kingdom, and they were Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, and Josiah. So Jehoshaphat was one of the good guys. He was definitely a good king. We know that. And yet he also made some not such great decisions. He got in an alliance with King Ahab of the north. Now remember Ahab had this, uh, this wife named Jezebel. We know about Jezebel. She introduced all this, you know, more idolatry into the northern kingdom. And yet somehow Jehoshaphat got involved with this guy. So much so that he eventually gave his son Jehoram to marry Ahab and Jezebel's daughter. So now you have this alliance going on, and so this is going to cloud his decisions. So the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir that are coming against them to destroy them may be in part of his own doing. So he might have gotten himself into this, this problem to some extent. But nevertheless, he goes before the Lord, he proclaims a fast, and everyone comes together. And then in verse 5, it says, Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. But they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are, rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. Jehoshaphat does some important things here. And if you're taking notes, you may want to kind of jot these down. And I'm uh, not really big into uh, alliterations, but I came up with this one if it will help you. First of all, remember who God is. Remember who God is in the face of trial. You see, what Jehoshaphat does is he goes back and he says, well, hold on, who is this God that I'm serving? I'm faced with an insurmountable trial. I have no idea what to do. And yet, I know that I serve a mighty God. I know that we serve this God who had made, has made us promises. We serve a God who is the creator of heaven, of the heavens and earth. We serve a God who is more powerful than you can possibly imagine. There's no one equal to him, whether it be in heaven or on the earth or below the earth. There's no one who compares to God. 
And you know, it says in the book of, uh, well, the Bible, it says 51 times, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. 51 times. Now, why would God say that? I have a theory. He would say that because we get afraid. We are afraid. There are so many things that would make us afraid. And if you just remember and you go through scripture, what do we see? We see these different things of where people had good reason to be afraid because their life was in danger somehow. And yet the Lord was telling these people, don't be afraid. You remember the children of Israel as they came out of Egypt. They had just come out. It took about a year to get from Egypt up to Kadesh Barnea. And God says, listen, I'm going to go before you. Don't be afraid of the inhabitants of the land. I will be a consuming fire and I will drive them out before you. So then they go in. They send in the 12 spies. And you know the story. They come back. You know, Joshua and Caleb say, let's go for it. We can do it. The Lord is with us. And the other ten is like, no, 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 we can't do that. There are giants in the land. Are you kidding? We can't go in there. Their cities are fortified up to heaven. There's no way. We look like grasshoppers in these guys' sight. And, you know, Moses tells us about one of these guys. His name was King Og of Bashan. He was this guy. He was about 15 feet tall. Can you imagine that? I would be running for my life. I'd be like, there's no way I'm going in that land. But you see, it doesn't matter how big the giant is. It doesn't matter what kind of scenario we are, we are facing. The Lord is more than able to take care of us. And so this is where we go back and we remind ourselves, all right, what has the Lord done in the past? How has he been faithful? What has he done to deliver me? To, live, to deliver the people in Scripture. Remember that the people in Scripture were just like you and I. We, we look at them now and we say, wow, they were so amazing and it was so much easier back then. It really wasn't. Well, if only I had had God speaking to me directly. Well, think about Abraham. God was speaking directly to Abraham. And what did God tell Abraham? Abraham, I want you to stay in the land. Don't leave, don't leave the land of Canaan. And what happens? A famine comes, and what does he do? He leaves. What does he say about his wife? Oh, she's only my sister, right? You see, his faith was tested so that by the time he gets to be, you know, well over 100, and now he has this son, Isaac, and God finally says, okay, now that you've been through all these trials, now that your faith has been tested, there's one more I have for you. And I want you to take your son, your only son, whom you love, and sacrifice him. And you see, you must, certainly Abraham was going back and saying, okay, I've been walking with the Lord for a long time now. How has he been faithful? Has he ever let me down? He's always come through for me. And so I'm going to be obedient to what he has for me now. So we need to remember what the Lord has done. And we need to go back and look at his past faithfulness and the promises that he has made to us. And then he goes on in verse 12. He says, O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. One of the great verses of Scripture. We have no power. This multitude that's coming against us, we have no power. We don't even know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. I can feel that way so often. Lord, I have no idea what to do. My wisdom is not sufficient. My own strength is not enough to get me through this, this particular trial. And sometimes it feels like it's not just one trial, but we have so many trials that are bombarding us at the same time. And it doesn't matter if it's not a physical army that's coming to destroy you. Again, we all have those various trials that test us. But these are the things that the Lord is using. Again, as Peter said, those is tested by fire may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The Lord is allowing these circumstances in our lives to shape us, to mold us. Here's the good news. The Lord wants you to pass. We so often think that when we're faced with a test, you know, that we're somehow being made to fail or that the Lord is hoping that we're going to fail. No, he wants us to pass. 
He wants us to pass the test. And he only allows us to go through different trials and tests that we can handle. Not in our own strength, of course. They're far too big for us. Again, think about those giants. There's no way that the children of Israel could have fought those giants by themselves. But when they relied upon the Lord, they were more than able. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel. And here they were faced with a big crisis, weren't they? Talk about options. Well, let's say you can bow down to this amazing statue that I've made of myself, or option B is you can be thrown into this nice, hot, fiery furnace. It's up to you. You know, it's, it's at that moment that our faith is really tested, isn't it? What are we going to do? And this is where you, you throw your hands up and say, I have no idea what to do. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, with quite a bit of chutzpah, they answer King Nebuchadnezzar and they say, well, listen, king, our God is more than able to take care of us. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down. It's that kind of chutzpah, it's that kind of tenacity that says, I am going to trust the Lord no matter what. I'm going to trust him. I don't care what you do to me. I will be faithful to my God. And I know that my God is able. Don't know exactly what he's going to do in this situation. But I know that he's able. And I'm going to plant my, theme, my feet firmly upon him. And so, again, he says, our eyes are upon you. And so, point number two there is that we expect God to fulfill his promises. We expect him to fulfill his promises. We remember what he's done. We look back. We think about all the things that he's done for others, for us, for how he's always been faithful. And then we expect him to fulfill those promises. When he tells us that he loves us, when he tells us that he's never going to leave us nor forsake us, when he tells us that he is going to fight the battle, that he will go before us as a consuming fire and he'll destroy our enemies, that is when we expect God to fulfill his promises. Verse 13, Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives and their children stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Methaniah, a Levite to the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all you of Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. The battle is not yours, but God's. Another great promise. The battle is not ours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz. And you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Yeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. There it is again. Don't be afraid and don't be dismayed. Just twice in this passage right here, the Lord says it. We find that so often throughout Scripture. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And you see, it's when we're faced with a trial. And again, maybe, maybe you're losing your home. Maybe you're losing your work. Maybe your child is sick. And you just don't know what to do. Lord, what do I do? I'm afraid. I really am afraid, Lord. It's okay to be honest with the Lord. It's always a good idea to be the honest with the Lord. He does know what you're thinking anyway. <laughs> oh, Lord, I'm not afraid. And he's like, yeah, right. It's not that he's chastising us for being afraid. He's exhorting us to not be afraid. Why would we not be afraid? Because guess who's going to fight for you? Guess who's going to come through for you? Who is this God that we serve anyway? Is he a God that loves us? Oh, yeah. He loves us through and through. I love the promises that he made to the children of Israel. He says, you know, don't think that you're getting this amazing land because, the inhabit because you're so much better than the inhabitants of the land. He says, no. And it's because they were so wicked that I'm kicking them out. But it's not because you're so much greater that I'm bringing you in. But I made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you this land. 
And I think we can so often become performance driven. We think, well, what have I really done for the Lord lately? Why should the Lord do anything for me? I mean, I'm not that great of a child. But think about your own children. You know, when they were little, you know, you were so excited. But then very quickly, you got up in the middle of the night. And that may have gone on for many years. And then, you know, other problems came in. The kids were fighting over who gets to have the Legos. And, you know, then something else happens and they borrow the car and they wreck it or whatever happens. All these things, right? So they haven't really uh, helped you out in some ways. But it doesn't matter. They're your children. You love them. And that's how the Lord is for us. Scripture says that as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. I take great courage in that. Because again, it's not about how amazing I am as a son, but it's how amazing he is as a father. And when I put my little kids to bed, I just go in there and I think about the things that happened during the day and this, you know, the screaming and the fighting and you know, all this different stuff, and you're just kind of like, oh, you know what? And you just look at them at the end of the day, and they're just so cute. <laughs> they're just so cute, and you love them. And really, that is the heart that the Father has for us. It's not because you're a perfect or a model child. You're not. Trust me, nor am I. But it's because you're His. It's because you're His. That's why He loves you. And that's why he's going to take care of you. You know, think about when you were on the playground back in school and there was that big bully out there, right? You're like, oh, where's my big brother and my big sister when I need them, right? And maybe your big brother or your sister, you know, came to the rescue or somebody else, you, you know, your fifth grade friend when you were only in third grade or something, you know, came and took care of you. All you had to do was just stay close to that, that uh, big brother or sister or whoever it was and say, I'm not worried about this bully, because I know this guy is more than able to take care of me. And you see, we have a bigger Savior. It's the Lord Jesus himself. He's the one that's going to take care of us. He is the one that will take care of us. And you know, there's also another dimension that we can see in this. Remember that there is a spiritual battle. It's not just against flesh and blood that's going on here, but it's against powers and principalities. If you think back to 2 Kings chapter 6, there Elisha and his servant were very surprised one morning. They came out of their tent, and lo and behold, there were the Syrians there to destroy them. The Assyrians were kind of ticked off because they knew that somebody was telling their enemies their every move. And they finally realized that it was Elisha because he's a man of God. So they're thinking, well, let's go and kill this guy. And then our enemies won't know our, what our next move is. So they come and they surround him. And the servant of the man of God, Elisha, comes out and he says, whoa, we're in trouble. And he goes back. He says, master, what are we going to do? Look it. We're surrounded. And, you know, Elisha, he kind of just gets up. He's like, you know, whatever, kind of yawning. And he says, oh, Lord, I pray that you would open the young man's eyes, that he would see that greater are those that are with us than those that are with them. And then it says, and the Lord opened his eyes, and he saw on the mountains horses and chariots of fire. Isn't that great? So there's this battle that's raging. We're sort of the prize. But there's a battle that's raging, and we, it's really, it's right here. We can't see it, but it's not very far away from us. And there are horses, and there are chariots of fire, there are angels, there are demons, and they are fighting this, this tremendous battle. In the 10th chapter of Daniel, Daniel had received a vision, and then he was praying for three weeks that he would receive an interpretation of that vision. And then finally this angel shows up, and he says, Oh, Daniel, beloved of God, know that from the day that you began to pray, I was sent to you. But I was withstood by the prince of Persia. And it wasn't until the chief prince, Michael, came 
that I could get away. And so I remained with the kings of Persia for 21 days. So again, this angel is sent. You have this, these other powers, these principalities and powers and demons, really, that are, are blocking the way. This is the battle that's raging up there. So behind all of this, behind the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir that are coming to destroy them, you have this, this spiritual battle that's raging up there. And so again, Jehoshaphat does the right thing. He goes and he prays. He reminds himself and the people of who God is. And then he says, Oh Lord, we have no strength. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. And then God reminds him, don't fear. Don't fear. I'm going to take care of you. Now we need to say this. Sometimes the Lord is going to fight the battle and we just stand there and just watch him do it. That is my favorite option. I love it when the Lord does it. But you know, sometimes the Lord will have us go out. Think about, think about David. You know, little David, right? Here he goes and he sees this uncircumcised Philistine and he says, you come against me in the name, you know, or you come against me with your spear and your javelin and your sword, but I come against you in the name of the God of Israel. And so he went out there. He took courage. He believed that what the Lord was going to do. He knew the Lord would take care of him, and he went. He didn't get any special word from the Lord. He just went and did it. And so there are those times as well. And so we have to just be in prayer and see what the Lord would have us do. Maybe he's going to just say, okay, I'll just take care of this. But maybe he's going to do something else as well. Verse 18, and Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah with the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. So they rose early in the morning and went into the wilderness of Tekoa. As they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you will prosper. Now, this is really the moment of decision. As much as I like the Lord to just go and do it, and I don't have to do anything, there is a tremendous amount of faith that is required. And it's not just the kind of faith like, oh yeah, I believe the Lord's going to do it. But it's the kind of that walking faith. It's the where the rubber meets the road kind of faith, where you really have to go out. I mean, think about this. If you're Jehoshaphat, you're the king of these people, you're responsible for your people, and you get this report that there's an army of three different nations that are coming against you, what would be your first and, let's say, responsible kind of response? Wouldn't it be to muster the army? Let's start sharpening the swords. Let's do something, right? But again, the first thing that he does is he goes and he prays. And then the Lord tells him what to do. Now, in some cases, it's going to be, hey, go out, get the, get the army ready, and sharpen the swords. Sometimes that's the message that the Lord has for his people. Quite often, David would say, David went to seek and inquire of the Lord, and he said, should we go up or should we not? Should we go out and fight this enemy or should we not? And the Lord said, go up, I'll give you victory. So there are times when we have to go out and we do something. We, we prepare ourselves. But in this case, the Lord said, no, you just stand still, and I'm gonna see, uh, you're going to see the salvation of the Lord. But this takes a lot of guts. This takes a lot of guts because for me, I'm always thinking about, well, what's my plan B? You know, maybe I misread the Lord, or maybe, you know, maybe he's just not going to come through or something. What should I do? What am I going to have kind of waiting back there in the wings? But we don't see this. We don't see Jehoshaphat, you know, getting the tanks ready just in case. He doesn't have the, the chariots ready. He doesn't have his soldiers. They're not taking swords. What does he do? First of all, he tells them, believe in the Lord and you will be established. You've got to trust you have to trust. And this is where we read in the book of James. James tells us that we are to trust in the Lord, we're to seek his face. And 
he says it like this. He's, again, brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, for he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. I really don't like that verse. I really don't. I'm like, Lord, is that me? Am I not trusting you? Am I looking for my plan B? Because maybe you just won't come through. Maybe you don't really care about me. Maybe you really don't love me. But again, these are all the attacks of the enemy to discourage me, to defeat me. And so now we will all find ourselves in that position of where we have to step out and say, okay, there is no plan B. Either I'm going to trust the Lord or I'm not. Either he is going to come through or he won't. But of course, we know that he will. And it takes a lot of guts. What does he do? It says, And when he consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should sing, should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. This is their plan? This is their battle cry? Okay, he starts singing songs. I mean, think about it. You've got a people coming to wipe you out. And you say, okay, let's, you know, let's get the children's choir and let's go out and sing. Or let's get you know, the church choir, whatever it is. Or let's just all go out and sing. We'll just sing songs to the Lord. This is their plan of attack. Oh, my goodness. Think about this. Over the next hill, and I'm sure they had scouts back then. They were like, you know, letting people know what's happening. Yeah, we can see them. They're in sight. You know, as they're kind of sort of looking down the mountain, they can see those. They can see those spears, and they can see the swords, and they can see the, the shields. And it says these people are coming to utterly destroy them. And they're putting all of their eggs in, the, in one basket, which is, let's trust in the Lord. Let's praise him. That takes guts. But that is the moment of decision. That is when you say, am I going to trust him or am I not? And so we see that he was depending on him completely. That's the third point. He depended on and trusted in God in the face of destruction and loss. This really is the hard part. Now again, if it had been me, I would have said, you know, Lord, it's enough for me if you just kind of send them away. I don't need to see anything spectacular. I'm okay with that. Have you ever, I'm sure, I, I'm sure I'm the only person who's ever prayed this, but Lord, could I just remain shallow? I like being shallow. I don't need to get any deeper. Just no more trials, please. I'm sure I'm the only guy that's ever prayed that. Because, you know, we're like, well, things are okay. Why do we need to do anything special? But you see, it was really through this event, it was through these people who were coming in, the, in that face of, Ultimate destruction. You know, you either you live or it's just, you're done. It's all over. This is when the Lord is going to do amazing things. And this is when we just say, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, hey, my God is able. I'm not going to bow down to that thing. I'm not going to compromise. I will trust in the Lord. And he'll do what he does. But I'm not giving in. And it really does take courage. But the exciting part, is if we stand our ground and we're trusting on him, we're depending on him, we're not going to flinch. Say, I have no clue what to do. I have no strength. I don't know what to do. But my eyes are on you, Lord. That is when the Lord is going to do something. Notice here in verse 22. Now when they began to sing and to praise the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. So it worked. They were trusting the Lord. They started singing these songs. They were praising God for who he is. You have to wonder what was happening there in, in the heavenlies, what was happening in the spiritual realm. 
It's too bad we're not told, but we can, we can kind of guess from other passages in Scripture that as they began to trust in the Lord, those hosts of, of wickedness in those high places were defeated. We read about in Isaiah chapter 24, it says that in that day the Lord will judge the host of heaven on high and the kings of the earth on the earth. So when the Lord Jesus comes back, it's not only the nation against nation kind of thing, but it's, it's the powers in the heavenlies. You remember in Revelation chapter 12, where it says that there was this great battle between Michael and the dragon, and that the dragon was cast out of heaven and no place was found for him any longer. So here you've got this battle. They start to sing, and the Lord sets ambushes against the people of Moab, Ammon, and Mount Seir. And verse 25, For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of all the inhabitants of, the, of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. So when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were their dead bodies fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. Wow. You just think, how can the Lord possibly do this? What is he going to do in my situation? Okay, fine, he did this for King Jehoshaphat, but how can he do this for my situation? My situation seems really impossible. Well, this is impossible too that you would actually have the armies that are coming to destroy you, God would turn them on themselves. That seems pretty impossible to me. And so they stood fast. They saw the salvation of the Lord. Now this is the part that's really cool. It says, When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies and precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. And they were three days gathering the spoil because there was so much. Isn't that amazing? You see, when we stand fast, we trust in the Lord, we're depending on Him, when the, then we see that moment of deliverance. And then after that comes the blessing. Now again, going back to my shallow prayer, I'm like, Lord, I really don't need to see all that blessing stuff. I'm really okay if you just have those armies turn around, you know, just kind of whisper something in their ear. You know, maybe they forgot to turn the stove off back home or something. Or, you know, they didn't come with enough food and they got to go back, right? So, you know, that's okay if they just turn around, they go home, and they don't bother me any longer. I mean, how many of us would just be like, that's enough for me, really? I'm not asking you anything bigger. You ever find in your prayers that sometimes you're like, well, Lord, I'm just wondering if you could just kind of you know, just do this little thing for me, as if we're afraid to really ask for it. We're afraid to ask for the big things because we're thinking, well, you know, you know, God doesn't really owe me anything, and I know he's busy, and, uh, you know, I don't want to be a pest, you know, so I'm just going to ask for the bare minimum. Lord, this, just this little bit right here is all I need. That's it. If you just give me this little thing, then I'll be happy. I won't ask for anything more. That's what we're so inclined to do. But the Lord wants to do a much greater work. He wants to do something far bigger than we could ever imagine. But again, it takes that faith to trust. We have to go through that trial. Imagine being Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, finding yourself in this fiery furnace and saying, hey, this is kind of (laughs) cool. No pun intended, right? Here you're, you're in a fiery furnace, and yet you're not being burned up. You're just, you're walking around, and now there's this other guy this, you know, one who was like a, a son of God, Jesus. Like, wow, he didn't expect this. This is great. But you have to be willing to go through that trial and for the Lord to do it. And so now they're being blessed with so much stuff that they can't even carry it away. It takes three days to carry all this away. Can you imagine that? Three days carry it all away. And on the fourth day they assembled in the valley of Bracha, for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore the name of the place was called the valley of Bracha until this day. Bracha means blessing. So this is known as the valley of blessing. 
known as the Valley of Blessing. Then they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat in front of them to go back to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. So they came to Jerusalem with stringed instruments and harps and trumpets to the house of the Lord. That is an exciting time of praise when you've seen God come through and do just amazing things. That is when we want to praise him. That is when we want to thank him. You know, we don't sing praise songs just because it's nice music or because we like to practice singing. But we want to come, we want to praise the Lord for who he is and for all those things he's done. And especially when we see this kind of a victory, we really praise the Lord. Verse 29, And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel then the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest all around. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. These promises are throughout Scripture. And they're not only for the Jehoshaphats of the Bible. They're not only for Jeremiah, they're not only for righteous men like Daniel, or Job, Noah, but they're for you and I. And so don't let the enemy come to you and say, you know what, you're done for. This is your problem. You made this mess. The Lord's not going to help you. If you had listened, that's one of his good lines. If you had listened, if you'd only done what the Lord had told you to do, you wouldn't be in this bind right now. Maybe that's true. But this is when you say, you know what, devil? I know where you're going. So just shut up. Get out of here. Scram. I'm going to trust in the Lord. It was never about my righteousness. It was never about my perfection. It was never about my performance. Had that been the case, the Lord would have never come and died on the cross. Because it wasn't about me being worthy of it, but him seeing the worth in me. Him, it was because God said that I'm worthy of the blood of Jesus. It's not because I've earned it because he loves me, because I'm his child. That is why he's going to fight for me. That is why he's going to take care of me. And so we are faced with these trials. What do we do? We begin with prayer before anything else. Go immediately to prayer. And that's when the Lord is going to tell us what to do next. Maybe we just stand and see the salvation of the Lord. But again, it's going to take guts. It's going to take courage to stand there and wait for the Lord. Maybe we're going to have to go out like David and say, okay, I'm going to just trust in the Lord and I know that this giant over here is not God's will. So I'm going to go out in great power and authority. And maybe he has another plan as well. But you have to wait and, and listen to see what he has to say. Then go back and remember what he's done. That will give you strength. That will say, okay, the Lord has done amazing things in my life, in the lives of those in Scripture, and then expect him to act. We have to expect him to act because he will. The Lord loves to come through for those that are waiting upon him. He loves to. He rejoices in that. He delights in it. And then we see him act, and then we experience his blessing. I like the blessing part, but I'm so often willing to just settle for much, much less. But I think we, ought, we need to reprogram ourselves and say, Lord, I want to see everything that you have for me. Give me courage today. You've told me not to fear, to not be dismayed, because you know that I'm a bit weak in the knees. You know that I'm getting those butterflies in my stomach, like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You say, I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust in the Lord, and he will do the work. Let's pray. Father, you are so worthy. You are so, so worthy, Lord. When we think about you, Lord, that it was by your word that you created the heavens, you created the earth, you created all the fish in the sea, you created all the beasts of the field, the birds in the sky, you created man upon this earth, Lord. We think about the beautiful things that you've made. Lord, who compares to you? Who is there like you in the heavens, on the earth, under the earth? There's no one like you, Lord. You are truly an awesome God. 
And so, Lord, we know that there is no one who can compare with you. There is no one who can change what you have decreed. There is no one who can compare with your power. And so, because we trust in you, we need not fear. We simply need to believe. And so, Lord, we ask that you would strengthen us. Though we are afraid so often, we are dismayed, but may we put our eyes firmly upon you and say, because the Lord has made this promise, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to walk accordingly. I'm going to stand. I will not fear, for the Lord is with me. And then, Lord, we would see you defeat our enemies, whatever they may be, whether it's a financial issue, it's a relational issue, if it's a health issue, Lord, and the many others, Thank you that you know each and every one of these trials that comes upon us and that you have allowed these. You have allowed these to test us, to try us, to prove us. And just like that gold that's going through the fire, you want to get out those impurities of our lives. You don't want us to remain shallow, but you want us to grow deeper. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you are with us. Thank you that you destroy the giants of the land. It doesn't matter how big they are. You are still bigger. You are still mightier. And so we exalt you. We praise you. We love you. And we pray that you would pour out your spirit here today, Lord, on each and every one of us. That we would be like a David against Goliath. Lord, that we would be like Joshua and Caleb saying, we can do it for the Lord is with us. Lord, that we would not rely upon our own strength, but that we would look for your strength. And then we would do great exploits for you to enhance your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.